Hello, yes. thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. And she's from Vitalab. So we're going to be, she's actually a marketing manager at Vitalab. We're going to be talking about egg donation, something rare. Yes. You, you know what I'm saying? Something yes, something red. still being talked about yes. in the early stages in South Africa. Yes, definitely. Yes, yes. And I've had an interesting conversation with her before we got on. You know, it's am- she'll tell you all about it. I'm just so amazed. And <laughs> I feel like this is something that we really need to be in deep conversation. Yes. You know, because there aren't a lot of people that know about it. Correct. We just know our egg donation. Okay, fine. But then we don't know the depth of egg donation and also, you know, the the, the price to it. Correct. If I may put it Correct. like that. Exactly. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Well, I think first and foremost, what I speak to all my egg donors about that mm-hmm. I think usually gives them quite a surprise mm-hmm. is that women are built very, very difficult differently to men Mm -hmm. in terms of reproduction. Mm. So women don't understand that they were actually born with all their eggs. Mm -hmm. We are not like guys who have stem cells in their testicles and able to reproduce sperm every other day. So our eggs are essentially as old as we are, plus then nine months. So the older we're getting, unfortunately, no matter what we do, no matter how active and healthy and everything we are, our eggs are aging as well. And they're getting as old as we are. And this is why there's something that's called the biological logical clock Mm -hmm. that women feel (laughs) and why egg donation becomes such an important role in that Mm -hmm. from both perspectives Mm -hmm. from the donors perspectives we're dealing with women between the ages of 18 and 32 Mm -hmm. who get to come into our clinic and have a fertility assessment something that if they had to do on their own would cost them thousands of rands and become unaffordable Mm -hmm. but something so critical to know as a young woman where you stand in terms of your own fertility so it's great to get that screening done mm. on donors when they're still young. Mm. Now let's talk about um, the age. So I freeze my eggs, 26, down the line, 46, but then my eggs are still as young as 26. Exactly. So cryopreservation is like a buzzword at the moment. Mm-hmm. You know, all the celebrities who are having children at a much older age, they've all gone down this route. Mm-hmm. They have frozen their eggs at a younger age. Mm-hmm. And what that means is your clock is essentially stopped. So if we are freezing your eggs at 26, mm-hmm. when we use them 10 or 20 years later, mm-hmm. those eggs are still only genetically 26 years old. Mm-hmm. So that means we avoid this risk that happens when we're using older eggs for all your genetic abnormalities such as down syndrome Mm -hmm. that is avoided because we're now using the younger genetically normal eggs yeah and how important is this because you know we're not really taught much about it as i had said earlier on that it's it's one of those things like okay egg donation it's fine let me move on with my life but you know there are a lot of things in it Correct. I think an important point is that one in six couples in South Africa suffer from infertility. Mm. And Mm. a big part of this can be looked at in terms of they have now started to try have a family at a much older age Mm. than what used to be. You know, previously having your child at 22 was fine Mm. and it was socially accepted. Mm -hmm. Now you're still finishing varsity, then you're starting your career, developing the career. Then when you get to 32, you're like, okay, now maybe I'm in a space Mm -hmm. or even at 35 and you're having your first child at that age. Mm. So it's it's very important to understand that this does affect more people than we believe it affects Mm -hmm. and that if you know at an earlier age, if you know where you stand reproductively, you can make those better decisions Mm. so that down the line you are not in that same position Mm. and the flip goes for the people unfortunately who are in it at the moment Mm -hmm. couples who desperately want a child but cannot use their own eggs now and they need egg donation they need Mm. donors who are willing to come in and help an amazing family have a child Mm. and how important is checkup Checkup is very, very important. Yes, at least once a year, I'm going to your gynae for all of the routine sort of checks. Mm -hmm. But I think what's important is is getting that assessment from specifically a fertility perspective. Mm -hmm. Having a look at your ovaries and what your potential is in the line of number of eggs that you have or number of follicles. Mm -hmm. Um, Seeing if there's any concern there, if there's maybe fibroids. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot that can happen within the reproductive system that the sooner you know about, you can make that decision 
mm. to to really go forward and how you want to. Mm. You know, if you're still single, you're not married, freeze your eggs. Mm. If you are married but you aren't ready to have children yet, freeze embryos because mm -hmm. that's even a greater chance than of having a child later on. So there's there's lots and lots of options available yeah. from both spectrums, mm. whether you're still young and in the informative stages or mm. if you're now at the point where you're a fertility patient. Mm. And, you know, when we, we were talking, we spoke something about culture because more especially in the black, in the African uh, yes. culture, we have those people that are like, no, yes, you can't freeze yes. your eggs. You can't freeze your embryos. Correct. You need to just chill. Correct. And just go there and bow down. Correct. And pray to your ancestors. Or you know those type. Correct. This is the, Correct. your normal day to day life. Yes. You understand yes. what I'm saying? So when you encounter some like or a couple that yes. would desperately need a child, but they can't have a child, and they come to you and they're like. Lester, this is what's happening. Please help out. Yeah, I think a, an important point here is there is a medical reason as to why they are now incapable. Mm. And this means it needs to be treated. Mm -hmm. And it still shocks me that people think of fertility treatment differently to how they would think of someone going for treatment for cancer True. or treatment for another disease. Because yeah. infertility is a disease mm -hmm. and it should not be a taboo topic mm -hmm. like it still is. Mm -hmm. But we live in South Africa and that is something we have to consider yeah. a lot of my patients decide to keep it entirely to themselves mm -hmm. so just the two partners who are aware that they're going through fertility treatment mm -hmm. and um, unfortunately it it means that they don't have that support that mm -hmm. people within other cultures would have their mom or their sister yeah. or a best friend yeah. and um, that's when we have to step in with a social worker or mm -hmm. a psychologist mm -hmm. who can offer that same support now, please tell, tell us about, you know, the basic requirements yes. for a donor. So, to be an egg donor, um, between the age of 18 and 32, um, basically, we need a matric because there is consent forms. Okay. Egg donation in South Africa is anonymous. So, okay. this means that you won't know who your eggs are going to and the same, the recipient doesn't know who's given them the eggs. And this is just okay. to protect your identity so that later down the line, if there was a child born from your donation, well, they're not knocking baby. on your door <laughs> yes when they're 18 yeah. so it's completely completely anonymous so we need someone who has a basic understanding to be able to sign consent forms mm -hmm. which is why we request a minimum of a metric okay. um, further to that BMI plays an important role so that would be your your body mass index so it's mm -hmm. your height and your weight mm -hmm. we try keep it under 29 okay. purely because we need to stimulate your ovaries okay. to get more than one egg ready because in a normal cycle one egg would get ready for ovulation mm -hmm. and that would be enough for your own attempt mm -hmm. but when we're donating eggs we need about eight eggs so okay. we need to get your body to produce a little bit more than that one so we stimulate okay. the stimulation medication has to travel throughout your body to get to the ovary to stimulate it mm -hmm. so the higher the BMI the more medication we'd have to use to stimulate you okay and that medication is very very expensive okay. Um, okay. a typical stimulation cycle can cost about 15,000 Rand so this is why we've put that in there mm -hmm. a weight requirement mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. purely to try keep the costs as low as possible mm -hmm. for our recipients. Mm. And how or rather are there any risks? No, so it. prior, of course, you know, a couple of years ago when the, the protocols and the medications were very different, there was a risk of something called hyperstimulation mm -hmm. where your ovaries would be overstimulated. Mm -hmm. um, that is not possible now with the new protocols that we use. Okay. So our clinic, and we've been around for 32 years, okay, has never had time. a case okay. of hyperstimulation. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very safe. Um, it's a great information session for these girls. Mm -hmm. They learn so much about their their bodies, mm. their own potential, mm -hmm. um, all of that. They, we do a full blood screening. There's so, so much that goes into it that yeah. really empowers these women to make better decisions mm. as well for mm. themselves. Mm. Plus, of course, you get paid to do egg donation. Yes, I, I'm, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to <laughs> that. And one thing, I, had a fr I have a friend. Uh, she donated her eggs. Right. Uh, but she was very free about it. Like, she would just tell, I'd be like, no, I'm going to donate my eggs. Like, she was just so free about telling us that she's going to do Lovely. it. And um, the proceeding was a bit, you know, because she would be weak and stuff. Because normally she would go and then come back to right. the show, then go home, sleep. And then she would go back again, maybe after two to three days. Yes. For another. Yes, another yes. checkup. Yes. Yes, yes. So it takes about five or six visits. And it can take about four or five weeks. Okay. Because we look at your cycles. 
So where mm-hmm. you are in your period, mm-hmm. um, and we start you on a contraceptive pill so that we can do date planning. Okay. So you would take a contraceptive pill for about 15 to 16 days. Okay. When we stop that pill, you then start about 10 to 12 days of stimulation injections. Mm-hmm. And for people who don't like injections, this is obviously the I worst don't. part because they are self-injections. So it's very similar to like what? diabetics who give themselves the injection yeah. in the tummy or on the thigh. Yeah. It's very, very similar to that. Um, you honestly don't feel it. It's such a small needle. Killister. No, I, I, I have... It, you, oh, no. It's honestly the easiest thing. It's not like an injection that goes into your arm where it's this long, long, yeah. big needle. This is a tiny little needle. It comes in those injection pens, okay. just like diabetics do. So it's very, very easy to use and it's mm-hmm. it's it's really comfortable. It's, it's not an uncomfortable experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's for about 12 days. And during that process, you have to come to our clinic about three times okay. because we need to look at your ovaries and see if they're responding. Mm-hmm. Are we now developing these little eggs in the follicles? Oh, yeah. Because if not, then we need to change the protocol. Mm-hmm. So that you'd come to the clinic quite often for. And then the egg retrieval itself, which I think is the daunting part mm-hmm. when people think, oh, it's going to be some big medical procedure. Yeah. But what's great is we do it under something called conscious sedation. So okay. it's not full anesthetic. So there's no risks that you get associated with anesthetic, okay. right? Okay. You're asleep, you don't feel anything. Um, and it's done pretty much under an ultrasound guide. And it's it's essentially okay. like a very fine needle that can go through the wall of the vagina into the ovary mm-hmm. and sucks out the egg out of the follicle. Okay. So there's no cuts, there's no stitches. So all that you do so, is well, while I'm asleep. Exactly. You don't even know what's okay. being done. When you wake up, you're comfortable because mm-hmm. there's no cuts or stitches. Okay. Um, you can go home that same day. It's not an overnight uh, procedure. Okay. So it's really honestly very, very safe and mm-hmm. something that's not an uncomfortable experience mm-hmm. at all. Because you know how doctors is like, so how painful is it? It's like, no, you're just going to be a little discomfort. <laughs> You get there, it's like a little discomfort. Yes, exactly. This is torture. Exactly. Yeah. And how how often can people donate eggs? So basically every three months um, is a safe sort of time frame okay. for you to be doing it. There is a limit set by the Department of Health okay. where you cannot have more than six live births from one donor. Okay. So we do need to keep track as to how many children are born from that donor. Mm. But from the number of donations, they could do quite a number mm-hmm. um, whenever they are then comfortable. You know, I have some donors who come to me once a year okay. to do it. Um, it's a great little boost towards, you know, either studying or a holiday mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so they don't want to do it every three months, yeah. but they still do it somewhat regularly. I have other girls who say, you know what, I'm happy to do it once. Okay. Like I feel like I need to give back. Mm-hmm. I want to do something good for someone. Mm-hmm. And they do it once and that's enough for them. They don't want to do it further than that. Mm. So let's talk about the remuneration fee. Yes, yes. So currently in South Africa, we pay 7,000 rand. So um, that's per donation cycle. Okay. So it's a great, great way to to subsidize. I mean, a lot of my donors are university attending students mm-hmm. um, who don't work full time. Okay. So getting this injection of 7,000 Rand is fantastic yeah. for them. Yeah. But yes, so there is that remuneration part. And um, of course, then all the free medical uh, treatments okay. and uh, discussions with the doctor and evaluations that mm-hmm. in other circumstances would cost you about eight to ten thousand rand mm. so um yeah and they, they're speaking with a fertility specialist okay. so super specialty it's not like they're seeing um a gp or a gynae okay. they're coming to someone who sp- who, who has specialized mm-hmm. in this and can yeah. tell them honestly yeah. this is what your chances are this is where your health is sitting yeah. this is where your concerns are mm. so when well you did say that sometimes you find women that come in and they don't know that they're hiv positive they want to donate Correct. but then here Correct. is a situation yeah how do you then deal it's it's that. very, very sad. I mean, um, we do see that a lot of, especially the younger girls, so mm. under the age of about 25, mm-hmm. um, have not yet been for all of that basic kind of screening. Yeah. And it is very sad when they come in all excited mm. and happy and they can't wait to help and donate their mm. eggs. And unfortunately, there's then some medical reason as to why they can't. Mm-hmm. One of which is definitely testing HIV positive. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it, 
it surprises me in this day that from our sex education perspective that this is not something you would get routinely checked yeah. yourself yeah. for your own safety. Yeah. But then we refer them out to a very, very good HIV clinic mm -hmm. who manages them for them. Mm -hmm. um, because we are a fertility clinic, you know, we're able to counsel them and also say, look, when you're ready to have a child, yeah. you can come back and have a child with us that will not be HIV positive. We help so it's lots. possible? It's very possible. Oh, we help okay. lots and lots of okay. HIV positive couples mm -hmm. have children that are HIV negative. Mm. So it's really, really not a death sentence, end of the road. Yeah. Um, there is always hope. Mm. Um, apart from that, we've had girls who have maybe gone to previous gynecological treatments mm -hmm. or surgeries, not actually knowing what they were consenting to. Mm -hmm. And when we scan them, we notice that maybe an ovary was removed or um, there yeah. has been, um, I had a, a girl who was struggling to fall pregnant. Mm -hmm. And when we scanned her, she had an intrauterine device. So she basically had like a Mirena. So we were like, well, this is why you can't fall pregnant. And mm. she had no idea it was there. Mm. So it's it's definitely from an education perspective, it's fantastic mm. for these young girls to come in mm -hmm. and, and get to learn about their bodies mm. and actually understand what they've gone through previously. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we offer support whenever there is, mm -hmm. when they turned away yeah. and they're not able to donate for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And we also spoke about, or rather I have a pamphlet here of, uh, non-invasive prenatal testing. Yes, yes, yes. And genetic screening, it's something that's also a little bit of a buzzword oh, yes. at the moment in South Africa. So basically what this means is a couple who in a natural circumstance would have a child with a genetic disease because both of them are carriers. Um, they can now have those embryos tested mm -hmm. and only the embryos that do not carry that genetic disease are transferred back. Okay. So their child would then not have that disease. Okay. Um, and a good example is within the Jewish community in tay mm -hmm. where if both the male and the female carries, the child would be born with this disease. Mm -hmm. So um, in those circumstances, they can now undergo IVF and we can screen out the embryos that are infective and okay. give them a child that isn't. Okay, what is it that you cannot do? <laughs> There's still lots we cannot do. I think, you know, news always uh, and the stuff that you can find online when you're Googling it sometimes puts a bit of a shadow over yeah. things. But we definitely, you know, designer babies is not possible. Yeah. <laughs> lots I, of people I, ask me about that. You, know? you cannot, you know, make your baby to be exactly what you want. That is not possible. You know, and, and one thing that really stood out was that you can make, say, I can't fall pregnant, then you find an egg, then you yes. can find an egg that has like similar features yes. as me and my husband. Yes. Yes, correct. So, I mean, with South Africa being so rich in culture, mm -hmm. you know, we, we wouldn't just offer you just a black race egg donor. Yes. We would find out, are you Twana? Are you Zulu? Are you Corsa? Let's find that same heritage. Mm. Then let's find the same skin tone color. Let's mm. find body shapes, face shapes. Let's match the blood group. So, yes, we can then put as much barriers in place to mm -hmm. kind of assure us that the child mm -hmm. will physically fit into your family yeah. and look like your family and still Those then so be accepted in that culture. That is so cute. I like being pregnant. The next next thing, I I, I like I literally just pop out a white child. <laughs> What? <laughs> what happened here? <laughs> no, you know? exactly. Yeah. So that's why we do so much to ensure mm. that we get it as close as possible yeah. for people. You know, you really are helping the community. Yeah. This is like a major deal. It's a family building. It is. You know, it's people who've lost Completely, all hope like, to yeah, like, and totally. thought they could never have a happy family. Yeah. And we give them that alternative. That is just so fantastic. Vitalab, yeah. where did you just surface? <laughs> I mean, you're doing incredible work. Yes. But really we couldn't do any of this without egg donors. And yes. this is why it's so important to get the education out there and get girls to come through for screening, mm -hmm. come through and see if they're able to donate, mm -hmm. learn more about their own reproductive. Mm -hmm. That's really where we're at currently. And how often do you do awareness? Do awareness, mm -hmm. sure, as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we do a lot on social media because that's okay. the best way to recruit yeah. egg donors. So we do a lot of that. Uh, radio stations where possible, TV stations where possible. Mm -hmm. We really do try and get out into the communities. Mm -hmm. It really just depends on on who's willing to welcome us, yes. like Unisa was. Oh yes, <laughs> oh yes, oh yes. And I feel like we need a screening, Paul. Don't you think that we need a screening? You know, for egg donors. Paul is just giving me the eye. <laughs> 
But anyways, uh, Sile, Calesta, thank you so much for joining us. And if people want to pleasure. find more about Vitalab yes, and yes. also egg donation and other donations that they yes. can just help out with, where can they find you guys? Yeah, best is a website. So the website is www.vitalab.com. Mm-hmm. Okay. Or if you want to go just straight to the egg donation, it's mm-hmm. VEDA, which is V-E-D-A, okay. VEDA.co.za. Okay. Uh, we are on Facebook, so you can find our pages on there. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, our number is 11 Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much for joining us. Thank you. Unisa Radio. Amtrita at Unisa Radio.